So, hey everybody, if you could take your seats. I have uh, Luis on stage. He wants to show you a very cool D experiment that he's been working on. I think it's the first time that there's been hardware at DConf, yeah. at least that I've been at. I think so. So come back. Grab a coffee, come back. And if you're getting hungry, don't worry. After this talk, we'll have lunch. So I don't want to give away the surprise or hype you up too much, Luis, but this looks, this looks pretty cool. So without further ado, please explain what's going on up here. Hello. Wow, this is loud. OK, so this is the hardware talk at the software conference. So let's talk about hardware. But before we do, if you can please go to this URL, I'll be, you'll be able to provide some feedback live if it works. I'm not sure it will work. And um, meanwhile, let's ask, do you know what hardware is? Do you really know what hardware is? So the URL is live.dhdlang.org. Let me change the slide. So think about this. You compile this piece of code with DMD. This is a mo function, which multiplies two unsigned numbers. So question one, is this multiplication implemented in hardware? Is it hardware accelerated, so to speak? You can answer it live, what your opinion is. I mean, this is an easy one to get started. But uh, let's give another easy one. Is this a hardware multiplication? This is a so-called Russian peasant algorithm, where you do a, a series of shifts and additions. Well, let's go back to the first one and say you compile the code not with a D reference compiler, but with a DMCC compiler, and you target an, an original 8086 Intel processor. And question number three is, is this multiplication implemented in hardware? Well, the original 8086 has a MOL instruction, so when you are executing that instruction, uh, the original 8086 will fetch a series of uh, micro instructions, which will go over the various steps to imp implement that multiplication. And now the issue is, what if I tell you that that micro code for the MOL instruction executes this algorithm we saw before? Does that make a difference in your opinion? Do you think that this MOL is implemented in in hardware. What if there is no microcodes? So we are back to standard uh, circuits without uh, ROMs with microcodes. But likewise, the multiplication circuit works through a series of additions and shifts. Question number five. Does this make a difference? Is this hardware still or not? So. I think there's a continuum here, and the idea is that something is software or hardware uh, to some extent depending on how much it uses, say, dynamic allo allocation of resources, it falls more on the software side, or hardware allocation of resources in a fixed amount, it falls more on the hardware side. If something is done in, in software, it can be very generic, while hardware tends to be more specialized. Question. I think your question was a little bit misleading. You showed a multiplication of two unsigned integers, which are defined for D as 32 bits unsigned. And the assembly you showed were uh, signed multiplication for 16 bits integers. So I wasn't really able to answer your question as you sort of showed two different things. And actually, as you said, it's an 8086 80, 80, 80, uh, Intel instruction set you actually don't have 32 bits. So the questions or the answers definitely no or depends. Well, just the answer in the spirit of the question. I mean, 
that's the way to go. Doesn't matter, you get the gist, right? Just an example. So, back to this idea. In general, in software, you, you are more flexible. In hardware, you are more hard-coded and so on. So, but why does this matter? Well, the idea is that hardware is no longer what it used to be. We are no longer seeing such fast progression in hardware performance. And uh, this is especially noticeable since around 2005 with a decrease increase in the clock rate. The Denard scale uh, has been uh, gone for a while. And this has mean that uh, we have started to look more into other alternatives than uh, raw CPUs because we are trying to explore uh, more parallelism. And this goes from simple things like multi-cores all the way to more specialized solutions like GPUs, FPGAs, and ASICs. And as you go down this line, you go down to more parallel solutions, more specialized solutions, but they are also harder. But you get some benefits like two or three orders of magnitude improvements in performance, power consumption. And we are seeing this in the real world. For instance, Amazon has had GPU instances for a while. It is also now introduced to FPGA instances. And these have huge FPGAs that are used to accelerate uh, uh, sof software with more sp specialized hardware accelerators. So if we want to use something like this, how would we bo go about creating hardware? Well, consider this piece of code. I don't know if it is, I know this isn't correct, but take it in the spirit of the question. This is so incorrect that this hardware calculator only works if there is no overflow or underflow. So there, uh, caveat emptor. Buyer be advised. You can use it like this. If you put 3 plus 4, you get 7. 8 minus 5, you get 3, as you'd expect. How would we go about converting this to hardware? Well, as I said, software is serial, while hardware is more inherently parallel. The gates all execute in parallel. So the first change you might go about doing is that let's think, can we make all of these lines execute in parallel? And if we did, to retain the same algorithm, first we had to undo that logic, and we have to put it so that each line only executes at the correct time. You put an IP variable, and um, you manually increment which line should be executing. And you can see that this still works properly. And in fact, I know that this works when, even when each line is executed in parallel, because you can jump to random lines, and it executes exactly with the same behavior. OK, so this is standard D code. But now let's jump into the fictional D code and imagine all of these lines are executing in parallel. As, we, as if we were building hardware. The next change we might do is that uh, we'll remove all of this put shard. They don't make sense in hardware. And here, uh, condition IP equals 3 and IP equals 4. Because they are m mutually exclusive, we can join them. We have a question. It's from uh, the D channel on Freenode. If you could either stop breathing completely or move the mic slightly away from your mouth. So you are calling me and if that doesn't work, just stop breathing. Um, That's fine. I'll cool. stop breathing. Thanks, Luis. Thank you. Sorry, D channel. So here we put these to execute in parallel and Let's now think about what hardware do we have here. For instance, we are going to substitute get char by some kind of input function. And here we have an adder circuit. In this block, how many sub-circuits can you identify in here? If you were to count like addition and other operations, how many of them do you think there are here?
Well, it depends on how we count it. But if we were doing something very naive, we'd say here we have a subtractor, here we have another adder, modulus, multiplexer, comparator, some more comparators. Um, so let's think about this. So here we have some registers where we will be keeping our variables. Here we are going to use an adder. We don't need the modulus because the, the addition will just, under of, will just wrap around in the IP register. Here we'll have some comparators. We'll use some more, header, multiplexer. OK, subtractor. I can count nine subcircuits here. By the way, this here is a multiplexer, MUX. The way it executes it's like this. If the select line is zero, you get the first answer. If it is one, you get the second one, and so on. OK, so the way you'd use these sub-circuits could be something like this. You take the A variable, you compare if the IP is equal to zero, and if it is equal, then you enable the register so you, it will be updated with a new new values. As you go down the line, you would add more stuff. But then you can start being clever and say, well, this is not very efficient in terms of hardware. So for instance, if I introduce here the concept of a decoder, and let me explain what a decoder is. So for instance, if you have 0, you get 1. If you have 1, it basically translates an integer to only a single bit being active, so which is called a one-hot encoding. So here with the, with the decoder, you'd be able to substitute all of these comparisons. OK. In the end, you'd get all of this circuit, which is equivalent to our D calculator. How do we know this, work? this works? Well, we can test it in a simulator. I put, let me see. Ah. Is my clicker not working? I put here one, I put five, pl operation zero, which is addition. I put uh, two, five plus two equals seven. Seven, operation one, which is subtraction. Seven minus three equals four. OK, it works. Question seven. There's an important optimization left to do in this circuit. Did anyone notice what it was? Well, minus x can be computed as the bitwise negation of x plus 1. So in the line here where we, we had the choice between adding the number or subtracting it, we could instead just use a negation of the number by using negation of b plus 1. And then it, it would work like this. It would work by using uh, the negation of b. So how would we implement that negation? Well, this is an easy question. Do you know what an exclusive or is? This, is, this should be much easier than the ones before. No tricks here. Well, if your answer is, oh, I know what an exclusive OR is. It's like, it is true when either one of the, the inputs are true, but not when both are true. Well, you aren't really going to the mindset of what an exclusive OR is. So another way to think about it is that the output is equal to, to B when A is 0, 
and it is the inverse of b when a is 1. So the way we do that b or the negation of b here would be through a series of exclusive OR gates. We split into the bits, we negate them, and we join them again. We'd have the same circuit, but now it's much more optimized. So this is one way to create hardware. You get some piece of, say, D codes, and you have some magic dust fairy pixie dust that uh, figures out what hardware am I going to instantiate that implements this algorithm? This would be our decodes, and this would be maybe the final result. A second approach, which is the mainstream approach, is that you would write an event-based simulation of your design, and then you let the tools infer what hardware would be consistent with that simulation. And finally, a third approach would be that you describe the circuit that we built manually in all those pictures in codes. So for instance, you'd say, this is the code. Let me instantiate some registers. Let me instantiate an adder, and so on. And then you connect them all in the correct way to produce the hardware we described before. So we have all of these approach. The mainstream when we use the standard industry languages like VHDL and Verilog is the event-based one. Today we'll be talking about DHDL, which mostly follows approach tree where you manually build out the circuit. So what's DHDL? It is a hardware design language that is implemented as a D language extension and a D library and it falls more on the builder side, as I was saying. And why should you care about the HDL? Well, say you are writing, for instance, some sum, and you do a sum of some values, and then afterwards you do a multiplication of some values, and because we aren't Go programmers, we might ask, why don't we have a generic function which does accumulate and you can parameterize it if you want either a sum or a function. So one way of looking at this is that where you are at the level zero of the abstraction ladder, uh, you have one tool which does one job, and as you go higher up in the abstraction ladder, uh, you start having one tool that does multiple jobs. Or another way to look at it is that uh, you generate multiple tools if, if of which do one job. So question number nine, at what level do you think hardware designers work? Level zero, level one, level one million. I think I feel that they, they work at level minus one. Yeah, it's that bad. I mean, if you have level zero, which is one tool does one job, and level one, one tool does multiple jobs, what would it even mean to be level minus one? It's like multiple tools needed to do one job? Just you wait. So how did we come to that? VHDL, for instance, was created to do simulations of hardware. The idea is that you simulate it, you check for correctness, and then manually you go build the circuit afterwards. But then some smart guy said, why don't we let the tools automatically build the hardware from the simulation? But what happened here is that uh, the hardware designers were so used to uh, describing the circuits in terms of those little uh, abstractions that in practice you have hardware described as little blocks without any obvious relationship. You can see the overall big picture, the algorithm. So you might get something like this, some part one, some part two, and these are all like if they were little threads that communicate through global variables, and you won't realize this is actually performing a sum. So you might get something like this, and you're like, I have no idea what that is, don't worry, I have no idea what it is either, because it is completely incomprehensible. 
So my argument was VHDL was originally created for simulation, right? Synthesis was added later, and problems arose from that. But then at least things related to simulation should be pretty good, right? Well, is, here is an example of some VHDL. You assign the full signal one, you wait for it to take effect, you print the result in the simulation, you assign it to zero, uh, you wait for it, you print it again, you get expected results, one and zero. Okay, not that bad. Later you think, well, what if I want to have multiple bits? So let's extend that to, say, eight bits. You put some ones here and then some zeros. You try it again. Error. Okay. Let's Google how to solve this. VHDL print uh, an ar array of bits. Hmm. The first answer is from Google Groups in 2001. This is not looking so good. Oh, you may want to use this function. What? Let's try the second one. Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is always your friend, right? Yeah, the usual approach is to create one's own library of test utilities, including to string. What? I mean, it's like, is this what the competition looks like? You have to write your own write alien function? <sighs> it's not that good. So, more seriously, what are the problems with the mainstream hardware design languages? Well, they are event-based, and those event uh, constructs, only a subset of which can you use to build actual hardware, and only a subset of that subset actually works in practice because different tool vendors implement different sub subsets. And because these are old languages, you get none of the nice stuff like object orientation, functional programming, generics. Everything is very verbose, everything is very repetitive, and worse, everything is very error prone. OK, so what are the alternatives? Uh, only VHL and Verilog are mainstream, but there are some competitors. For instance, you have several solutions using the Haskell language. Uh, there are for Scala, Chisel, and Spinal HDL. My HDL for Python is also well known, and a few more. Uh, DHDL, which I'll be talking about today here, is based on Chisel, and it's very similar art alternative Spinal HDL. And the idea is that uh, um, DHDL is like, is, uses the Chisel hardware construction model, but without the Scala DSL text, the problems of using a Scala DSL, and you get all of the nice benefits of this modeling power. What do I mean by the Scala DSL text? This is just a trivial example. Uh, this is DHDL codes. Uh, this looks almost like D codes. And the equivalent chisel codes would be something like this, where you have triple equals instead of equals, because there was a problem using the regular equals. You have to put false.b because of using the DSL. You have to put the braces because those are actually functions in disguise. I have to use some special syntax for the otherwise, and so on. So how do you get uh, uh, to use the HDL? Well, it follows the Chisel module. So in Chisel 2, the way it works is that you put some Chisel Scala codes, and you get out Verilog, which you can use for simulation and synthesis. With Chisel 3, they introduced an extra step where it gets converted to fur RTL, which is like LLVM bit code, but for hardware. And in the HDL, the DHDL code gets compiled to regular D codes, which then gets converted to fur RTL. Then you can use it in the very log with simulation synthesis. These steps here are what is working at the moment, at least as a proof of concept prototype quality. This step here of converting the DHDL to regular D code uh, is still work in progress, so it has to be manually done at the moment. 
Okay, this is what we'll see today. How to write some DHDL code and do simulation and do also synthesis to run it on a, an FPGA. So, do you know what an FPGA is? The way I think about FPGAs is that they are like the largest very long instruction word CPU. What do I mean by that? If you've ever seen a, a VLIW CPU like the Itanium, they execute bundles of instructions where each bundle has some instructions that execute in parallel. For instance, this bundle here executes instruction 1, 2, and 3. Then you go on to the next bundle which executes instructions 1, 2, and 3. So an FPGA is like a million instruction bundle, very long instruction words. Like, you have a million instructions, they all execute in parallel, and the challenge is how can you use that to make anything that actually works in practice? Another way to, to look at it is it is a, an interpreter for hardware. Why do I say this? Well, this is what an FPGA looks like inside. You have these lookup tables, and you have routing that connects the lookup tables. And the idea here is that the way you fill the lookup tables, you are implicitly describing different gates. So for instance, if the outputs are 0 and 1, you might get 0. If they are 1 and 1, you might get 1, and so on. And that relationship defines the different gates which will actually implement your hardware. For today's demo, we'll be using a Papilio Pro in this talk, which is based on a Spartan 6 LX9 FPGA, which has 1,400 slices, where each slice, I think, has like uh, four lookup tables and eight one-bit registers. And uh, it has some block RAM to more efficiently create little pieces of uh, static memory. It has some hardware multipliers to do more efficiently multiplication. You also have here the some SDRAM and a 32 megahertz crystal oscillator. You'll get 48 I/O pins in this so-called Papilio wing form factor. And the idea here is that, for instance, if you look at this row of pins. You have all of these pins. The way they work is that you have some eight data bit pins and some power pins, and they can be connected in different ways. In the other two rows, we have the same structure. And the way you use it is that uh, you can buy some ready-made uh, wings, which are like Arduino shields that do some hardware function like audio, uh, VGA for video and so on. And for instance, these wings here take uh, eight pins each one. You also have some larger ones that take some more pins, one row on each side. And uh, you have some really big wings which take all of the available pins. One good news here is that the Gadget Factory has been so kind to provide an FPGA and some wings to give away here at DCONF. So if you took the answers I asked you in their intended spirit and you answer them somehow, uh, you'll increase your chances of winning this FPGA. It will be given out to some person here at the conference at a later date. OK, how do you actually use DHDL to create something in an FPGA. So this, I think, would be a good hello world. It doesn't get much simpler than this. You have some input port, some output port, and the simplest relationship between them. You connect port B to port A, and one way to think of this is that you are describing this hardware. It's like you took a wire, connected one to the other, except that you only let the signals pass in one direction. How do we know this actually works the way I described them? Well, the hardware design community has a lot of problems, but one of the things that they do very well is that they always create unit tests, which they call test benches. 
So this is how we would do a simulation of this hardware in the HDL. Uh, here I created a PicPot tester of that module. I assign to the pin A false. I update my model and check that the pin B is also false. If I assign pin A true, I get true in B as expected. So a very, very simple example. The way this is actually implemented in terms of the simulation is that this DHDL circuit is converted to regular decode. This step here is the one that at the moment you have to do manually. And these decodes will get inspected by the DHDL library to generate the fur RTL uh, description of the circuit. The library then gets to convert that fur RTL to standard Verilog. These will be converted into C++ for simulation using Verilator. Here you have a C++ header file which describes the fields where the signals of the simulation will be present. You get the, the code of the simulation also generated automatically. This is loaded as a shared library. In the DHDL library, I use a regular expression to look into the C++ header file and find out where all the signals are. And then here in the unit test, when I assign the different values, what I'm doing is that I'm setting the values in the, in the correct fields of the C++ generated code. That would be for simulation. How do I run this on real hardware? Well, as I said, as part of this tool chain, you get some Verilog back. And what you can do is that you add some constraints to assign the different pins to different FPGA pins in the real hardware. Uh, so here I'm assigning button, a button to pin A and an LED to pin B. IO standard of VTTL basically means that uh, uh, 0 volts is false and 3.3 volts is true. So I built some, a circuit with some buttons here. The way these buttons work uh, is that I use some single pole double throw which they toggle like this between the, the ground and the 3.3 volts. So conceptually, when you change the pins, you are toggling between true and false. And then you pick out the generated very low, very low code. You put it in the synthesis tool. It generates some bit file that you load into the FPGA. And then you can use it on the actual FPGA. So here is a demonstration. You have here the LED in the FPGA. And you can see that when I toggle the button, according to our circuit description, it also toggles the LED. So this is a very simple example. How do you build some more complex logic? Well, you just use standard D operators. So for instance, if you have two input uh, ports and you want an output port to be the logical end of those two bits, like in this, this circuit, we have a, an end gate, you just use the standard DHDL code. You'd go over the same uh, routine. You have some simulation. You get standard decode. Na 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 na. You put it in the FPGA. And then here you see that the LED only turns on when I turn on both of the input buttons. Any questions so far? So here you oh, it you looks like we do have a question. You know, you could uh, simplify uh, the generation of code and stuff and the simulation with the uh, CTFE. And that would be re really cool because then you can take step out of your uh, build and let uh, DMD do it at, at compile time. Which step would I be removing? Um, you could uh, do the uh, the uh, 
the creation of VH of uh, VHDL and uh, mm. simulation. Sorry, in I DMH can't do that because I use some external tools, so they can't be run at uh, compile time. I think, not yet. Okay, not yet. Good news. This is getting better all the time. So. Here, we are, our output just depends on the input, so we don't have any states. Um, but now let's think of another example, for instance, where you want to blink the LED. So you have to keep track of the state here, if the LED should be on or off. So you just have output port A, which will be our LED, and a register with one bit of memory for the states. And then you toggle the states between uh, uh, the different states, and you assign the LED the current state. And one thing to notice here is that, do you see those two last assignments? You can't switch the order of them, it doesn't matter. And the reason for this is that we are describing this circuit like this. We have here the one bit register. We have here uh, the assignment of the states with the inverter to assign state equals not state. And then we have here the LED gets the state, gets the result of the state. And because we are just describing those connections, it doesn't matter in which order you make the connection. Conceptually, it, it's the same thing. OK, so question number 10. Will port A blink? Andre says no. I'm such an evil person here because it depends on what you mean. I here have a simulation. Andre, you're wrong. It's blinking. I also have here some D unit test where you say blink.a equals module 2 of the index, and this unit test passes. It works. Sorry, Andre, you're wrong. I think what you mean to answer is, will the LED on the actual hardware blink? What do you think? Will it blink? You can answer before I show you the answer. Yes. It smokes. So you're the one that will write on the other fields. OK, let me load it into the FPGA. It's not blinking. Why isn't it blinking, Andre? The speed. We have here a 32 megahertz crystal oscillator. So unless your eyes are really, really good, you won't see the blinking, right? And your constraint file will reflect this hardware, where you say, I want pin A on the pin of the <coughs> LED, and you get the clock with a period of 31 Point twenty-five nanoseconds, which is uh, our 32 megahertz crystal oscillator. So, Andre, how would you fix this? Delay. Okay, let's add a delay. Let's add some counter. And our counter, we count some number of cycles, which depends on our clock rate. So, when the counter is different from zero, you will decrement it and not do anything. Once, you, once it reaches zero, you will toggle the state, so you have some delay. Question two, is this enough for it to blink, though? Will it really blink now at one hertz? What do you think? Am I being evil? Do you have to take it in the spirit of the question? OK, I load this into the FPGA, and it's blinking. OK, it wasn't so bad. Some more DHDL concepts. You, do you see here the reg uint counter? Uh, this is not a 32-bit uint as in regular D. And it gets assigned the width based on its initialization value from the clock rate assignments. But you can do it manually, like this. Or if you don't want to use magic constants, you can get the width from the clock rate uh, constant. Let's now build some more complicated hardware. You know what uh, UART is? It's like a, a serial port. So if you want to transmit, say, by 
zero, byte one, which is missing the picture, by twos, and so on. Uh, you transmit it bit by bit, and the way this is encoded in, in transmission line is that you have a start bit, which is zero, and a stop bit, which is one. So the code for this could be something like this, where you, wait, where you have uh, the actual transmit, the actual bit pin, which is txd, you have some, the bit will load as the enqueue variable port, and uh, the, the UART transmission module will say it is ready to accept a new byte, and the client will say it is ready to provide that byte with a valid port, and the buffer starts initialized to just once, which means it is just transmitting here the stop bit, so nothing is transmitting, and so on. The important thing here is that uh, in the TXD port, you just transmit one bit at a time. You can later, if you want, go over all the logic. doesn't matter right now. Just let me give you some more concepts. In the HDL, uh, you can concatenate bits using the tilde syntax. And also, another important difference is that you can slice bits, but the, the order of the indices is reversed because of the way we write numbers. This becomes more intuitive. You can also add some more high-level concepts. For instance, here uh, we can uh, use a decoupled to uh, condensate all of these ports. So for instance, here you could have just decoupled of eight bits that you are going to enqueue, and you would update, it, you would update the circuits, and you would define all of the pins to use the UART. You instantiate the UART like this. You say you want to create a new UART at a given baud rate. Here in this example, I'm just saying, I'm always transmitting the character D, so this is always valid. And you can, for instance, I put this in an FPGA, and I could connect putty on the COM port, I just see D, 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 executing. Some more hardware, I built a seven segment display. You just get to show some digits based on the pattern of the which LEDs light up, and you multiplex uh, which digit is showing at a given time. By the way, do you remember which hardware this is with the one that provides one bit? This is a decoder that we saw before. For today's demo, I'll also be showing an F, an F, a VGA circuit where you, according to the VGA spec, use different voltages to represent the colors. And you, the logic here is very simple. Just keep track of which area of the screen you are drawing and some audio. This is done as a delta sigma deck, where the idea here is that you just add all of the samples and uh, the most significant bits of the, th that sum will be output in the speaker. And we all, with all of these uh, accessories, we can do a demonstration. Uh, I put here uh, the hardware, and I put some arcade joystick and some buttons. So this will be our arcade. Do you want me to show it on the actual uh, hardware, or maybe it would be faster just to show you on the slide? We're getting a bit out of time. Uh, yeah, we're about the five minute mark, but you can also leave it set up during lunch if you think that okay, that makes so sense. Okay, so I'll now show it in the slides, and then you can check it out later with more time during lunch. So, which game should we use in our arcades? Something related to D. Here, you can see the picture of the setup I have here with the LEDs and the, the joystick and so on. I write here the program that I will be running in a CPU simulated inside the FPGA. You can see here, as I'm loading the different segments into the FPGA of the software, it has a counter as it loads through the UART the codes. 
And then when you toggle the simulated CPU in the FPGA, you get something like this. Toggle it, in it initializes, and what game is this? I toggle it to player, uh, computer versus computer mode. I s press a switch, and here, yep, this is classic Empire running on FPGA. <laughs> Just one more slide. I didn't show it here for lack of time. But for this work, I have an SD RAM controller. I have a RISC-V soft core CPU. I have a cache to interface between the CPU and the, the RAM. And I have a lot of stories on how I had problem implement, compiling the classic empire with the RISC-V backend. So let's talk about all of that during lunch. Thank you. We have time for a couple questions. Anybody has any questions? Or anything from IRC or the YouTube chat? Oh, Walter's got a question or probably statement. Well, first, you know, great demo. <laughs> but, but second of all, you can buy like FPGA cards to plug in your PC. Yes. Can you program them with uh, your system? Yes. Cool. Yeah, uh, that was a super cool demo, and uh, thank you very much for this uh, very great project and the talk. Thank you for your kind words. Any more questions? Or praise? Bring all the praise, please. <laughs> so how did you implement it? That's like a complete domain-specific language, right? And then you have a, supposed to have like a separate compiler step that does the translation to like the D thing? So it's first it's a transpiler which compiles from DHDL to D and then or you can write manually the low level D code and then use introspection on the generated class to find out all of the signals of your circuit and um, you execute the decode for it to create the connections, and you walk over the graph of the connections and you write the equivalent Verilog or FER RTL code. Then you use external tools uh, in an automated fashion to produce all of the stuff that will eventually be loaded into the FPGA. And, and in the same way, do you think it's, it's a better way to write your small transpiler instead of hacking in a DSL in the language and I trying to use functions and whatnot? I started by doing this as a DSL in D. And what I found out is that if a DSL in Scala has problems, a DSL in D has a lot more problems. And uh, even if you manage to solve some of them, you are always going to have the DSL text, where the syntax is not as nice. You have some problems because the library doesn't understand your code fully. And when you hide all of that behind the compiler, for instance, these days you have an Objective-C objective compiler which understands all of the Objective-C concepts, right? And it can provide better error messages, while originally it was just like a preprocessor. So the logic here is the same. Uh, the w if you implement it using a compiler that really understands those constructs, you get better error messages and so on. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. So, huge thank you to Louise for this really cool experiment. We'll have lunch now. There'll be a buffet outside as well as upstairs. So if there is a huge line, just go to the one upstairs. There should be some meat eaters food, some vegetarian food, and also some vegan food. So it should support all of your dietary needs. And I saw some people already grabbing drinks from the bar in the back. So just two notes about that. During the conference, the majority of drinks that they serve 
um, are covered, of course, by the uh, D Foundation and also Sociomantic and any of the other sponsors or partners we have. But don't forget that the bar staff enjoys tips. They're working hard for you. So that's really awesome if you throw some love into their tip cup. And um, after the conference, if you stay around and have drinks, it's totally welcome. Um, but then they are paid for by yourselves. So that's it for your drink and food announcement. Enjoy your lunch, and we'll see you back here in about an hour. Jasper wants to say something but lost his voice. What about it?